Welcome to The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. I am your host, Cicely Davis. What a week, what a week. And welcome back, American Savages, to The Savage Truth. Yours truly here, Cicely Davis. So glad you could join me today. A very warm, a very hot, a very muggy, muggy morning, very sunny. Um, But a welcome, a warm welcome to you. If you're new here to the channel, Sit back, relax, and enjoy, and tell someone else to join us next time. Bring someone along. To all of you ride or dies, been tuning in and listening in on a regular basis, as always, I want to let you know that I appreciate and thank you. This is a precious commodity. What? Time. Time is a precious commodity, and your decision to spend some time here with me means a great deal to me, truly. You know what I'm going to ask. It's always the same. Whether you're new or ride or die, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Please and thank you. Now, let's get into some truth, some savage truth, shall we? Big news, big news. As you know, Joe Biden is out. Now, I know we've all heard the talk and the news of Joe's clearly, um, his clear decline over the years, right? This is not new to the Republican side. Um, But the Dems are finally willing to admit that, right? Clearly, the debate was the nail in the coffin to where they could no longer hide it or try to excuse it away. Plus, he's been nothing but a true embarrassment to them in front of a bunch of I told you so Republicans, right? Now, I was, of course, doubtful that Joe Biden would drop out because of his own obstinance and stubbornness. He hates to lose. He hates to drop out. He hates to give in. I was also taking into account As you know, the determination of Dr. Jill Biden, thinking that even if he wanted to drop, Jill was not allowing anything less than the title of first lady for another term for another four years in the White House. But such that is, is he's out. He is out. Not surprising to many of you, perhaps most of you, for those of you who are certain he was going to drop out, good for you. We did have lots of smart people that watched the show, so I'm not surprised. I'm glad that you were more right than I in this moment. The polls this weekend show Joe down seven in Michigan being significantly down nationally and predicted by many experts in the polls to lose the electoral college by a um, hundred or so. So that's a big move. That means what? Basically, Joe was predicted to lose, predicting that he was competitive in New Jersey, holding to lose my state, believe it or not, Minnesota. He was even predicted to lose Minnesota. Apparently, he had no other choice but to leave pressure from the Democrat leaders, the Democrat elite, um, the Obamas, forced him out by way of extreme and continuous pressure. Now, he made the announcement on X, not in a press conference. This is interesting. Now, I would think that he would do a farewell kind of press conference. You know, after all, he was all hot in the seat when he was called cognitively declined in that report some months ago. Um, That spurred an immediate response from Joe Biden, where he got out and made a complete fool of himself. But the announcement to drop out of the presidential run and before the Democratic National Convention, no less, only gets a Twitter mention. Okay, seems a little strange to me, but here's what's interesting. He's not retiring from the presidency itself. He's saying that he's not going to run. Now, my savage thinking self instantly wonders and wants to ask, If he's qualified to run the country right now, then why is he not qualified to continue running for the nomination for the Democratic Party? Okay, that's just how I think. I'm sure that's how you think. Here's how it all went down. His decision to drop out. Apparently, it wasn't until Saturday evening that Biden began to come to the conclusion that he would not run for re-election. He started writing a letter to the American people. Biden had been off the campaign trail for a few days, isolated because of COVID-19, catching it for the umpteenth time when it all started to deeply sink in. His worsening chances of being able to defeat Donald Trump with so much of his party in open rebellion seeking to push him out of the race, not to mention the persistent voter concerns about his age that were only exasperated by the catastrophic debate. By Sunday, his decision crystallized. He spoke multiple times with um, Vice President Kamala Harris, who we're going to talk about a little bit later here, whom he would endorse. He informed White House Chief of Staff Jeff Zients Zients, and his longtime aide and campaign chairwoman Jen O'Malley Dillon. A small group of senior advisors from both of the campaign and the White House were assembled for the 1.45 p.m. call to relay Biden's decision 
while his campaign staff released the social media announcement one minute later. Here's what he wrote, or someone wrote for him, on X. My fellow Americans, over the past three and a half years, we've made great progress as a nation. Today, America has the strongest economy in the world. We made historic investments in building our nation and lowering prescription drug costs for seniors and in expanding affordable health care to, to a record number of Americans. None of that which is true, and please just keep that in mind, okay? But Joe Biden is not leaving, everyone, because of his cognitive decline or his senility. He is leaving because he is losing, period. Okay, keep that in mind. He goes on. We've provided critically needed care to a million veterans exposed to toxic substances. We passed the first gun safety law in 30 years, appointed the first African-American woman to the Supreme Court, and passed the most significant climate legislation in the history of the world. America has never been better positioned to lead than we are today. Untrue, as we all know. He goes on to say that we've protected and preserved our democracy, then another excerpt reads, it has been the greatest honor of my life to serve as your president. And while it has been my intention to seek reelection, I believe it is the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down and to focus solely on fulfilling my duties as president for the remainder of my term. I will speak to the national, to the nation later this week in more detail about my decision. Now, in a follow-up message on X on Sunday, Biden also announced that he's endorsing Vice President Kamala Harris. And it reads as follows. My fellow Democrats, I have decided not to accept the nomination and to focus all my energies and my duties as president for the remainder of my term. My very first decision as the, the party nominee in 2020 was to pick Kamala Harris as my VP. And it's been the best decision I've made. Today, I want to offer my full support and endorsement for Kamala to be the nominee of our party this year. Democrats, it's time to come together and beat Trump. Let's do this. <laughs> now, before we get into Kamala Harris as the nominee, let's recognize one thing, one thing. As said here on The Savage Truth, and that is that Joe Biden has created a diabolical scenario for the Democrats to where they had no choice but to push Kamala forward. We said this in the last two episodes prior. Had they passed her by, she would have, of course, claimed racism, screaming at the top of her lungs, followed by sexism, and caused a massive DEI uproar. Remember, Joe Biden said his VP was going to be an African-American woman, thereby making his choice by way of criteria, not merit. Now, I've gotten to know the Biden really, really well. Okay, I've been studying them and I have to wonder what kind of deal was cut to get him to actually agree to drop out. I believe that will come out later down the road, but there's so much to focus on. There's so much happening all the time. So Kamala has to choose a VP. It will be interesting and pertinent to Republicans and more to Democrats, I would say, as to who she chooses. Moments after President Joe Biden dropped out of the presidential contest and endorsed his vice president on Sunday, speculation began swirling over who would be Kamala Harris's running mate naturally. Of course, you've all heard the names and proposed, but I will run those down for you in case you haven't heard the full gamut of the nine possible, top nine possible Dem VP choices. Number one, of course, there's Gavin Grusom. Gavin Newsom of California, I think his name has been floated the most. The two of them out of California, as scandalous and as corrupt as they both want to be, they are truly two peas in a pod. They know each other. They know how one another thinks, how they act, how they'll move. But why choose someone from a state you already have? In fact, because that was my original question, this presents an issue. Newsom, who's 56, was a prominent surrogate for Biden and has been governor since 2019. Prior to that, he served as San Francisco's mayor and then the lieutenant governor of California. Newsom is often discussed as a potential presidential candidate, but would face a huge hurdle serving as Harris's running mate for one simple reason. They both hail from California. Under the 12th Amendment, electoral college members vote for the president and vice president, but one of them shall not be, and I quote, shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. So that means if Harris picked Newsom as a running mate, they would forego all of California's 54 electoral votes. So I think the state of the Democratic Party, we can rule out Gavin Newsom. Not really seeing them foregoing 54 electoral votes as tenuous 
as this um, contest will be against Donald Trump. Number two is Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who many have rumored that Jill Biden was actually favoring her, not Kamala. She's 52, served as governor since 2019. Prior to that, she served in the Michigan House of Representatives and the Michigan um, State Senate. She's been considered a potential 2028 successor since she won the gubernatorial race in 2022 by nearly 11 points in the battleground state. Michigan was a key part of Biden's pathway to the presidency in 2020 after former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton narrowly lost the state in 2016. She also reportedly threw her support behind Harris on Sunday. Number three is Senator Mark Kelly of Arizona. Dems need Arizona, and perhaps this will help in that state. Kelly, who easily won his reelection in a state Biden carried for four years ago, is being eyed for his unique biography, having flown combat missions in the Navy Command and the International Space Station as an astronaut. His wife, former Representative Gabby Gifford, has become a hero to grassroots Democratic organizations fighting gun violence after she was a victim of it at a campaign rally for her own reelection. The attack left her severely injured. Number four is Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. Pritzker, who is 59, is seen as a possible presidential candidate in part for his standing in the party and his ability to self-fund a campaign. His family started the Hyatt Hotel Empire. He's in his second term as governor and before that was active in Democrat funding fundraising circles. Number five is Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who many say would be the most strategic and smart. Not sure why he's so well liked in the state, but his name apparently sparks great interest. Pennsylvania is key to a state. You win Penn, you win, okay? You win Pennsylvania, you win. Shapiro, who's 51, has served as governor since 2023, and prior to that, he was Pennsylvania's attorney general since 2017, county commissioner, and state representative. If Harris were to pick Shapiro, it could bring in some extra votes from a swing state that Democrats desperately need to hold if they want to hold on to the White House. Number six, Governor Andy Bashir of Kentucky. Number seven is Roy Cooper of North Carolina. Number eight is Maryland Governor Wes Moore. Wes, who's 45, um, pretty young, became Maryland's first black governor in 2023 and is widely seen as a possible candidate for the White House in the future. The young governor, just 45, like I said, also has a resume as a New York Times bestselling author for Rhodes Scholar, combat veteran, and former CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, which is an anti-poverty organization. And last but not least, we have Pete Buttigieg, another former contender for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2020. Pete Buttigieg has also formally endorsed Harris. He said in a statement on X that Harris was the right person to take up the torch, defeat Donald Trump, and succeed Joe Biden as president. That alone says he's disqualified. <laughs> Buttigieg, the youngest, is 42, is Secretary of Transportation currently, was known among his supporters as Mayor Pete, as the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He is also the first openly gay person confirmed to the presidential cabinet. Buttigieg is also a Rhodes Scholar and served in Afghanistan. Some other names, such as Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota, was actually mentioned, and, of course, Hillary Clinton for another possible all-woman ticket. And I have to say it, it would be hard to imagine Hillary taking a backseat to Kamala, but considering Hillary, who still believes, as you know, that she was robbed of the presidency in 2016, I guess I could see her being strategic for four years, kind of biting her tongue, waiting for her chances to try to um, get back in, possibly, maybe. Well, we had quite a week last week, ending with Joe's dropout, right, um, yesterday. Um, we had quite a week with the RNC, the Republican National Convention, almost 2,400 delegates, obviously a supportive political environment that's actually good for Republicans running for Senate, Right. That RNC was good for um, Republicans running for Senate. It's good for um, Republicans that were running for governor and House seats all the way down. Donald Trump officially accepting the nomination as the endorsed presidential candidate for the presidential run for the 2024-2028 term. He, of course, is selecting J.D. Vance as his VP and running mate for that said season. Now, these are exciting times. Truly exciting times for the Trump administration, for Republicans, for conservatives, and for America, right? 
as we have begun to see, particularly in the year 2024, the tire, the exhaustion from the American people of far left shenanigans. Illegal aliens squatting and taking over citizen property, illegal aliens assaulting far too many and actually killing American citizens. We have criminals committing crimes and going unprosecuted, while citizens who protect themselves, their families and their property are prosecuted to the full extent of the law. We've seen abuse of law enforcement, men and women's sports, men and women's lockers rooms, men and women's sorority, men and, men and women's beauty pageants and everywhere else. Right. We've seen the mutilation of children through destructive gender ideology, the erasure of family, sexualizing children, our ch children's schools curricula with sex ed and deviancy for second and third graders. We've had drag queen story hours and drag shows for kids. Anti-Semitism at a criminal level, the decline of education and academia through affirmative action, racial divides through divisive and wrong theories such as CRT, the 1619 Project, and push through destructive and asinine books like White Fragility. We've had DEI destroying corporations and the workforce and problematic terms like white fragility, white privilege, and poverty. Poverty. We've seen widespread poverty taking over in the middle class as gas and groceries and energy bills continue to skyrocket as inflation continues to increase. Americans basically have had it. I know I have. And it's showing through the embrace and support of Donald Trump, not to mention the appeal of J.D. Vance to those who are the working class, those who understand what it is to work for a living. Right. That's who he appeals to. Those who understand what it is to work for a living, to have to save for their futures. Those who punch clocks, got their hands in their feet. They get their hands and their fingernails dirty. They deliver goods. They climb electric poles. They pick up trash. They keep the grounds where they work um, neat and clean and orderly. Um, they work in warehouses and they drive trucks. They know what struggle is, and yet they love what they do and appreciate and love America. And they miss the America that celebrated the 4th of July with big pride and waving flags, fireworks and cookouts, hot dogs and peanuts at the baseball games. They miss face painting for football games and booing their sport rivals, gathering for Thanksgiving dinner and opening presents at Christmas. They're looking for someone who can give it back to them. And I believe that is the Trump Vance ticket. You know, I mentioned it before, but this was the most patriotic fortress of I had seen in four years. People decided to celebrate America without shame and without hesitance. Both red and blue voting demo demographics. They were celebrating America, but they were also sending a message that they love this country. They w don't want to give it up. They miss our societal norms and they want her back and they are looking for the team, the team, the administration that will give her back to them. I believe the greater power of the American people believe and know that the Trump Vance team will and is committed to doing just that. After a terrifying, devastating and nearly fatal assassination attempt nine days ago with Donald Trump, um, this sends a message of hope and unification and love for country. And this is exactly what the Dems are afraid of, because that message is resonating with Republicans, of course, but with Democrat voters and independent voters and never Trumpers and with those who don't typically vote. And with this current announcement of Joe Biden's dropout, by the way, of extreme and continuous pressure, it makes you wonder, what did it take to get Joe and Jill to agree to drop out? With the top Dem leaders being successful in pushing Joe out, the question is, who's running the country and who's been running it for the last three and a half years? Because guess who can pressure Donald Trump to drop out or do nothing? Absolutely no one. But Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi and Hakeem Jeffries were among those who apparently and allegedly spoke extensively to Joe Biden to give up that run. Small dollar donations have totaled forty six point seven million for Kamala Harris. But let's end with this to keep in mind. Kamala Harris was just gleaming, of course, to accept Biden's endorsement. Her statement was as follows. In the coming days, the party will undertake a transparent and orderly process to move forward. This process will be governed by established rules and procedures of the party. Our delegates are prepared to take seriously their responsibility in swiftly delivering a candidate to the American people. Now, 
The comment reflected the reality that while Harris is emerging as a prohibitive favorite to become the party's nominee, backed already by Biden and many Democrats, it's really not that simple. And for now, the party isn't offering many details on what happens next. That being said, Harris has a has to formally secure the nomination from around 4,700 Democratic convention delegates, including those pledged to Biden, as well as the elected officials, former presidents, and other party elders known as superdelegates. Now, please take note, pay attention to this. This is important, I think this is significant. Obama has not endorsed her. The Clintons have not endorsed her, and now we're hearing that Joe Manchin is considering changing parties in order to changing his independent association to possibly run and challenge Kamala as well. So again, lots of turmoil and chaos in the Democratic Party. But I will say this, it's really great now to be Republican. It's great to be conservative and it's great to be an American right now. The move was risky, what they just pulled yesterday. These are high stakes. But guess what? On our side, we're betting on red. <laughs> Please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, as always, be bold, be strong, be faithful, be true. Till next time, I'm Cicely. The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis is a production of Front Page Magazine and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.